Bienvenida to the Spanglish Mama, a Juby Joy podcast. Are you a Latina mama seeking for a faith-based community of moms that are intentional in parenting their children? Are you looking for ways to overcome negative words spoken towards your children that do not align with God's purpose for their life? Hola mamá, me llamo Eli Conklin, a Latina mama of two babies under two. I love Yeshua, and apart from him, I can do no thing. I am on a journey of Holy Spirit-led parenting to raise my children God's way. In this podcast, we will uncover what kind of words have secretly and seamlessly slid through our daily vocabularies to shape our children's lives. This is a no-shame zone, a place of forgiveness, and where we can become empowered by biblical truth. Let's turn it around for our children and generations to come. Let's break the cycles from the start. ¿Estás lista? Acompáñame en el episodio de hoy. Hey, Faithful Mama, I have a special treat for you today to honor the fathers in our lives as we celebrate them during Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, everybody. I know this podcast has been all about you, Mama, but today I have invited one of the people that poured into my husband, Jesse, and I, and he we sat in his discipleship class. He is a voice that is going to speak life to you and the father of your children. So go grab your husband husband, your baby daddy, your fiance, your boo friend, your brother, el primo, really any man in your life, your sons, pausa aquí, okay, pause and get them because this voice I'm welcoming today to the podcast is about to minister truth and love in the area of fatherhood. And who is he? He is a first a general in the kingdom of Yahweh, a prayer warrior, an intercessor with God-given supernatural authority. He is a father, a biological father to four courageous boys, uh, men, <laughs> as I know they're aging, and he is a godfather to anointed baby girls. So he's a minister to the people in the local church where he resides and is an owner of multiple businesses. He he is a pioneer and innovator who is trailblazing the Malachi movement. Help me welcome to the Spanglish Mama podcast this powerful voice by turning up your volume dial and be in expectation that you're about to encounter a breakthrough in fatherhood. Let's cannonball right in. Welcome, Minister Vincent. I'm so blessed to have you here in the Spanglish Mama podcast. Please share with the listeners your testimony, where you came from, and how did God, how did God, the Father, transform you? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And the introduction all by itself, I am so unworthy and I can't take any credit because if it wasn't for Yahweh, then there would be no me. So just thank him and thank you for allowing the perspective that you have of me to be through his eyes. So that's a blessing all by itself, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, as the word says that our righteousness is as filthy rags to him. So even on my best day, I know that I need him and um, that I'm nothing without him. So I just give honor to him first. Um, and then I give honor to my spiritual parents to whom helped uh, disciple me and grow me and mature me and cultivate me and endorse me and are, are the real epitome of what you're looking for in a spiritual parent. And so um that's the first thing I want to do. The next thing I want to say is uh, I'm 40 years old. I'm just a, a man from Toledo, Ohio that uh, grew up in the projects. I have five brothers, two sisters. So it's eight of us raised by a single mom and growing up in the area or in a community where um, there isn't a lot of fathers around. I would say within a three block radius, there were, you know, three different projects and, um, it was a lot of single moms and the guys that did pull up, you know, in the hood or in the projects in the inner city, they, they dressed a certain type of way. They have multiple girlfriends. They carried their, their way. I mean, they carried themselves a certain type of way. So from my perspective as a, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old looking at these guys, then th their perspective that they were given off the influence that they had is what I thought a man was supposed to be, you know? And so 
I began to mimic them and beginning to mimic them, of course, um, without them having the right um, influences, without them having male role models, without them having God-fearing parents that help cultivate and teach and train them in a way that they should go in certain ways, then, of course, you know, you kind of grow up um, missing certain things that you may need to grow up effectively and efficiently the way that God intended you to be so you can walk in your purpose. And so um, I realized in mimicking some of the behavior, it caused me to really be, as I grew older, to really be a a boy in a man's body going through life from that perspective and, you know, uh, doing drugs and misusing women and running the streets and uh, even throwing away, you know, uh, what could potentially been a sports career. I, you know, play football all through middle school, high school and everything. And um, I got to the point where instead of going to practice or instead of uh, doing the things that I needed to do in school, I would rather go over a young lady's house, you know, because I didn't have that father in place to tell me, son, they're going to be there. That's going to happen. You have time for that. Go this way, you know. And so there were ways, you know, that I bumped my head um, that could have been prevented if there was a father in the home, you know. And so going through life, you know, and allowing the what the world said about me, what the street said about me what the hurts and pains, rejections, abandonments, and the different things, how they formed me, how the words that, you know, people attach to me and unconsciously coming into agreement with some of those words and some of those perspectives at times, they really formed and framed who I was, you know, but, but is there's always a, but because, uh, as my pastor says, you know, when God's hands is on your life, he got a way of getting you to turn the way that you need to go. So I remember, you know, at 30 years old, uh, moving to Georgia and, uh, I went on tour with one of my cousins. He's a, uh, professional R and B singer. And, uh, he asked me to do security and to train him and everything. And so I was on tour with him and I was doing that. And, um, you know, chain of events happened and um, I had to go back home for a little bit. And when I went back home, I ended up uh, getting in more trouble uh, than I did uh, before I left. I ended up selling more drugs. I ended up drinking more, uh, taking more pills. I had a hundred dollar a day Percocet habit where um, I had an ingrown hair that on my face that turned into a cyst and uh, the doctor prescribed me Percocets. And from that day forward for about a year, I had a uh, um, Percocet habit, you know, and so um, I end up doing a whole lot worse than the things that I was doing. And I remember, you know, getting into some some big trouble. And one of my uh, friends called me to go, you know, ride with him. You know, when you, when your friends call you to ride, you ride. If that's your real friend because you know they're gonna ride for you, you know. And I end up almost, you know, putting my life in danger. You know, whether I wouldn't be here anymore or going to jail or whatever the situation, or however it would have panned out or however it would have ended up. So I remember calling my cousin back and I said, Hey, I got to come back. I got to, I got to, I got to uh, take advantage of the opportunity you gave me the first time. I said, because if not, I'm in the dead or in jail or doing something I don't have any business doing. He said, come back. So I came back to Georgia. And when I came back to Georgia, I had already had a job lined up at uh, LA fitness, uh, the gym. And uh, so I called them, asked them if the job still available. And they said, yes. So I flew back to Georgia, stayed with my cousin, got the job, got certified as a personal trainer because I'd al- already been training in Ohio uh, for years. And so I got certified as a personal trainer and working at LA Fitness and things like that. And they wanted me to shave my face because on tour, I had the big old beard and, you know, it's a, it's a rugged job. So you got to have a rugged look to go with it. So uh, the personal trainer director at LA Fitness told me, you can't uh, work here like that. You got to have a clean cut. So I'm like, all right, that's fine. So I go over to my brother's house. My brother lived here in Georgia at the time. And he always cut my hair, you know, all through uh elementary to middle school to high school like I was probably the one he got his practice on to make him the um the amazing barber that he is right now and I kind of joke with him and tell him that but I go over his house and when I went over his house you know I know my brother and I just seen him you know in Ohio not too long ago and he was shining he was gleaming he was glowing and he was talking this God stuff and I'm like God like God what like 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 what are you talking about God and he was telling me that all the things that God had did for him and in um, his testimony of what God had done for me, I could see the fruit of what God had produced in his life. And so I'm like, like, how did you know it was God? Like, was his voice deep? Like, how did you know it was him? And, you know, it was like a mystery to me. And he said, V, he said, uh, and these words stuck with me um, 
and still stick with me to this day. He said, "Be God." He said, "I can sit up here and tell you about God all day." He said, "But God wants you to find out for yourself." He said, "God calls on all of us." He said, "But um, but um, it's up to us to make sure that he doesn't get the voicemail." And so, you know, that kind of stuck with me. That kind of rung in my spirit. So I went back home that day after getting my haircut, and you know, I didn't know what to do to hear God or to be in a position to know if He's talking. So I start listening to Kirk Franklin. I start praying what I thought was the best way to pray. And I start reading the Bible, which at the time was just a visual exercise because I didn't understand the thousands and thousands and shouts and all that stuff. I remember going to church. And when I went to church, I remember my pastor asked me, have you ever been baptized? And I said, yes. And he said, have you ever had the evidence of speaking in tongues? Because one of the first initial signs that you've been born again is the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I was like, um, no. And so my pastor's wife said, well, do you want to? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I've tried this street thing. I've tried the drug thing. I tried all of that. So what do I have to lose? And so I got baptized and I came up out of the water and well, they took me to the back and explained to me uh, what was going to take place and who, what my inheritance was in God and um, the plan and purpose that God has for all of us. And so after that, they kind of let me know what was going on and what to do when I got baptized. And when I came up out of the water, I came about uh, filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. And it really blew my mind and i remember being coherent but also kind of like an out of body experience and and i remember when it first happened i was trying to stop it like like what is this and i remember it got more aggressive and aggressive and it was almost like i was worn in the spirit you know through my tongues through my praying and then uh it went on for about five minutes and uh after that i just you know i kind of cried because i had a supernatural encounter with god himself you know and from that point in time um i quit uh smoking uh cigarettes cold turkey i quit uh fornicating i was absent abstinent until i was married you know i began to um learn how to put the things in his hand that I was so used to figuring out a way out of no way, um, but really allowing him to bring me to the end of myself. So that way I can do it the better way, the more efficient way that he may get the glory. And, and it points back to him and not back to me. Wow. What, what an amazing journey. I mean, you went from, as you said, um, growing up in the projects, the streets, drugs, women, really a worldly lifestyle to, having this amazing encounter, a supernatural encounter with Yahweh, with God, and coming into, really stepping into this faith walk that is supernatural with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I just want to go off of, you know, now going off of there, you know, you're growing in your walk. And I just know from being in your class that you really grabbed onto fatherhood. You had a revelation, you went deeper. So walk, you know, talk to me about that. Talk to the listeners about that. What did that grow into that relationship now? Um, and what is the meaning of fatherhood to you? Well, I would first say we all oftentimes come into the kingdom and we understand God as the sovereign king and uh, creator of the universe and almighty God. But we um, we get a real revelation of who he is to us when we understand him as father. And I remember my pastors teaching on fatherhood. I remember sitting in one of the ministers in Eagles Fire's uh, um, house, uh, Prophetess Kendra. She was uh, doing a minister's class. She was teaching on fatherhood. And um, each of us had students, were, uh, as the students, had to minister on fatherhood and different subjects as well. And as I began to seek it out and search it, search it out, it just began to hit home. I, it gave me a deeper understanding. He used my sons. You know, I have uh, four boys, 20, 21, 14, and 12, you know, and um, he really gave me an understanding of who he is to me by how I am with my boys, you know, and getting a, a revelation that it don't matter what I did bad, what I did good, that there's nothing that I could do that could cause him to love me less as with my own boys. It doesn't matter. There's not a decision that they can make that can revoke their right to be my son because I had them like they come from me just as I came from him. There's nothing that I can do that can revoke my my inheritance of being his son. And so getting a revelation who he is as a father, then it created more 
it, it took me out of religion and brought me into relationship. It took me out of supernatural God, which he's always supernatural God, but it took me into daddy. It took me into not worrying about, you know, uh, 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 not dotting the I's and crossing the T's and being fault finding and realizing that my daddy is here and his job as his responsibility is to cultivate and teach and train and endorse because th those are some of the, the the definitions of fatherhood is to cultivate and train and teach and endorse and one of the things that stick out to me in fatherhood the most is to cultivate because when you look up the definition of cultivate it means to till to plant and to grow. And when you think of a farmer, a farmer tills the ground. The farmer tills the ground, he breaks it down. Then the farmer plants the seeds and then the farmer grows the plant. And that's who God is as a father. He has to break us down from what the world told us that we was or the lies and the hurts or the pains or the different things that formed us. He has to break it down in order for him to plant. But what do you do uh, with soil before you plant a seed? You break it down to make sure that it can receive the seed. So he had to break me down so that way I can order to receive the seed of him as my father. And when I began to receive him as Abba, when I began to receive him as daddy, it 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 really blew my mind the the way that I began to get cultivated in his nature, in his attributes, in the relationship and the closeness that I have with him and him allowing me to uh, the blessing of being able to impart that into my sons as well. That is amazing. You said something that I just absolutely love. You know, it that fatherhood took you from religion into relationship. And would you share just a little bit about that breakdown process? What what did that look like? Because some people, they come into, you know, they think they know God, but they they sometimes they don't allow that breaking, that cultivating that you're saying, that tilling. Could you share just what did that look like? You know, just of, off of what Holy Spirit is reminding you, what did that look that look like at that moment for you? Well, being raised in a household where, you know, that my dad wasn't around and my mom was, you know, superwoman doing the best that she could to raise six boys and two girls. You can only imagine what that looks like to raise eight different kids, let alone six men. You know, a lot of time growing up in a household where mom's doing the best that she can to make sure that, you know, she cultivates, provides and takes care of the things like she needs to. There also is a role that she is fulfilling that was meant for a father. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember a lot of times and, you know, mom having to be hard and, you know, feeling, doing what she felt she needed to do to toughen, you know, us up as young men. There were a lot of times where, you know, I would get in trouble and not even just, not even just at home, whether it was in school or whether it was with my friends over neighbor's houses and different things like that. I realized that when I did something wrong, it was always magnified. It was always highlighted. It was always put on display like this big, huge thing, whether it was small or it was huge. And I remember when I did something good, it didn't get that same energy. When I came into the kingdom and lacking fatherhood, then I treated uh, God the same way that I got from my parents, from them having the lack of fatherhood. And so I looked at at God as he was pointing out my wrongs and he was pointing out my flaws and he was magnifying my faults. And so I was always in a place of deep sorrow and trying to prove to God, like, I'm, I'm good and and I, I'm trying to do right. And I'm trying to be right. And I remember God set me down in my prayer closet one time and he just began to just love on me like the liquid love from the throne room just began to flow to me. And he was just loving on me, you know, and allowing me to understand my son. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you do it. You, you may even have to deal with the consequences of your decisions because I gave you a choice. But that does not take away from me being your father and I love you and you are great and you are capable and you can do all things. And I, I gave you the ability to, to wear this armor that you can fight the good fight of faith and to have the same mind that also be in me, that way you can be productive and flow forward. And so when I got the, what broke me in the, to, that, to build the relationship was not 
in, in the correction, because it says that God chastises those he loves. In the correction came affirmation. And a lot of times we grow up where we get corrected, but we don't get affirmed in the process. And you have to be affirmed in the process. If not, then whether you're a guy or a girl, if you lack that fatherhood that's supposed to affirm and cultivate you, then you will grow up wondering whether you make good decisions or not. You will grow up people pleasing because you're always looking for someone to approve you or to help you know that you did the good thing and the right thing. And, you know, and, but those come from the absence of fatherhood that comes from the absence of being cultivated and being affirmed. So the word says that if my mother, and my father forsake me, then God will lift me up, that he will draw me up. And it was not that my mother and father forsook me, but what they didn't have in him, they could not give me. So of course, there were times that I looked for it in other places. But when I got to the place and realized that it was only in him, it was the affirmation that came with the correction. My son, you're doing this. Don't do that. Do it like this, because this is more effective. And this is affecting you in a negative way. If you see the cycle of how you're repeating it. So let's do something different. You know, he re- he, he loved me to a place of sonship. He loved me to a place of of my inheritance and knowing that that there's nothing that I can do good nor bad that will cause him to leave nor forsake me, that he would always be there. You know what I'm saying? Come on. That's amazing. The liquid love of God, like the agape love and who so many things I want, I want to go off of there, but the father takes many responsibilities right in the home, like as provider, as protector and just talk to us about that role of uh, being a king and a priest in the home. What is it? What does it look like for you? And then what encouragement do you have for dads regarding this role? Like after they have this, this connection with the Lord, with Yahweh. Well, the, the first thing I would say, always you testifying from my own experience is a lot of time there, there's four stages of manhood. There is a boy, there's a man, there's a husband, then there's a father. And a lot of times, and even in my own case, there are a lot of times that we make ourselves husbands and fathers before God is done making us men. So now we put ourselves in relationships, in marriages, we put ourselves with someone and now they have to, if we're in God and we're being cultivated and we're um, growing and maturing and having the desire to go to that king and that royal police priest place, then those people that are with us now, they got to watch God process us uh, through the stages of boy, a man and the husband and the father. You know what I'm saying? And, and it can cause friction in a relationship. It can cause identity crisis. It can cause divorce. It can cause a lot of things to happen. Why? Because you skip some of the steps. You put yourself in a role or in a position that God um, never intended for you to go into outside of this order or, or outside of this structure. And so that can create a lot of challenges and a lot of issues. But um, the awesome thing about God is he's ever teaching and ever given wisdom. And it even says in the word that wisdom cries out in the street. And even the king asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for gold. He didn't ask for silver. He asked for wisdom because if he had the wisdom and the wisdom would give him everything that God has for him and bells and the whistles on the side, you know? And so, so that's the first part. After you get to the place of you really allowing God to uh, grow you and mature you and cultivate you because in and, and, and that cultivation process, one thing that I realize is we grow up in ways or we are cultivated in ways from the world that we believe is our truth, that we believe is part of who we are. How oftentimes do we hear someone say, well, that's the way I am. That Well, I've always been like that. Well, just because that's the way you are or you've always been like that doesn't mean that that's always been the truth of who God says you are. So um, the first thing that I would say into walking in that king and royal priest place, whether you have went through this process of God molding you and making you or you in that process right right now is be open, you know, be open to change, be open to the fact that, you know, he knows you better than you know yourself. Why? Because you come from him. He is your creator. He breathed the very life into your lungs that caused you to have your being. And so um, learning to put down your guards and learning to uh, put down your wall so that way he can really come in because he's not going to judge you. Um, He's not going to hurt you. You know, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to magnify 
the things even that could cause you to self-inflict um, um, yourself. He's not going to do those things. He's going to show you him. And in him showing you him, you'll see in love where you may lack him and where you um, need to look more like him. And the more that you uh, get into that place of intimacy through, per- through prayer, through spending time, just like you do in a regular relationship, how do you learn your mate? You learn them by spending time with them. You learn them by intimacy. And intimacy isn't always between a man and a woman and in a bedroom intimacy means into me see into me see so for me to open up from my most vulnerable place and allow you to see in and so there is intimacy and fellowship in that place just like i can allow god to see into me then he can allow me to see into him and if i can really build off that place off that relationship then i can see in him where what I don't have. I can see in him where I haven't been operating as a king. I can see in him where I haven't been operating as a priest. I can see in him where I hasn't been, where I haven't been loving or there have been conditions to my love. And so the first thing that I would say is, you know, build the relationship, you know, and and trust me, when it when you start building a relationship, you probably gonna feel like, what in the world am I doing and stuff like that. But you got to be consistent in anything that you do when you do consistent. Um, me, even me as a personal trainer, being consistent and working out then I get the best results in my consistency. And so um, you have to be consistent in that relationship and you really got to be adamant. You got to be, you got to take the limits off and not allow anything. You got to have the mindset that I'm going to have this relationship, you know, like Jacob had. Jacob had held on to the angel, said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God, I'm not going to let you go until I build this relationship because I want to walk as the king and royal priest that you called me to. Wow, that's amazing. So many great wisdom drops right there for dads that might be feeling like um, I'm not getting this or I'm not understanding or, you know, I haven't had that encounter with the father. But it's right there is building that relationship and then allowing the Lord to walk you through the stages of manhood. So how can moms be supportive of the, our children's fathers, how can we, as they're being worked through, you know, as a father says, okay, I want to go into intimacy. I want to be a better dad. I want to understand how God, the father loves me. How can we moms be supportive? How can we be encouraging? How can wives be, you know, take that role as a helper through this process? What have you seen? What have you learned? The two things stand out to me. And the first thing is understand that this is uncharted territory for him. And one thing we know is anytime we're in an uncomfortable place, if you go to a town or a city that uh, you're not used to being in, you're learning, you're using your GPS and you're learning what streets to go down and what turns to make and where to go and how to maneuver in this new place because you've never been here before. So be understanding that he's in a place that he's never been before. And so if you see, you know, him, the, not, not even see, if you believe and if you are already together, and I believe that you believe in any way that he has desire to change, to move forward, to be great, to be all the father that he desires to be, then uh, instead of highlighting where he may miss the mark or where he may fail, um, always encourage him, baby, you can do it again. Yes, that may have happened like this or may have happened like that, but you can do this. Because one thing that I realized about a failure is it's only a failure if you stay down. Because to me, fail means you got knocked down at a place. But if you stay down, then that's a failure. But if you learn from the situation and you can stand up and keep moving and make better decisions, then you didn't fail. That was a lesson. So there's a difference between how you look at a, at a failure, whether you're going to allow yourself to learn from it or you're going to allow yourself allow it to put you in a stuck place. So if you see him, that passion and that desire to change and to move forward and to be all that he can be for the wife and for the kids, then encourage him. Um, Even when he does stuff wrong, if it's something that he's just getting on your nerves, like, oh, get out, then instead of you deliberating that to him, take it to God. And the awesome thing about taking it to God is if God has you bring it to him, then he's going to have you bring it to him the way that God would give it to his son. And not from the perspective of you felt like you was right or wrong or to get your way, because it's not about your way or your husband's way. It's it's about God's way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the word says a wise woman builds her house and a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. And this scripture 
is so powerful to me. That showed me that God gave woman a power. He, he gave them a strength. He gave women a tool, a key, a gift that he didn't even ask of men because he knew the power in a praying woman. And one thing I remember one of my sisters in the church asked me, she was like, my husband, he won't watch the kids for me. And so how do I do it? Because it gets on my nerves because I want to do this too. or I want to do that too. I said, well, this is what you do, sis. You go tell him, babe, I love when you watch the kids. Like they respond to you so well like they so much more subtle and at peace and they just they be so happy and smile it's almost like i'm not even around when you in the room like the way that you do that babe like you such a bomb dad he may not even be dotting the i's or crossing the t's but the fact that you gave it to him and you deliberated it to him like that and he may feel like well you know what i do got a little feel with my girls they do respond to me well baby baby you going about your business i got the girls tonight why because you fed that thing in his man that allowed him to to cuz as as men like god made us there's there's a hunter in every man regardless like god made us hunters you know to bring home uh whatever is needed to provide to protect to cover so you always have to give the man something to hunt after and by giving it him to it giving it to him in that deliberation it allows him to know that he was able to hunt and bring home uh the meal whether the meal was love whether the meal was your break whether the meal um was the encouragement or watching the daughters or whether it was physically the check that he brought home to pay the bills like he was able to hunt by your encouragement. And one thing that I realized is I remember, you know, being with a woman and I remember she made me think that I could fly. Oh my goodness. Made me believe in myself more than I believed in my, I mean, made me believe in myself more than I did. And I thought that if I jumped off a building that I would, I would land on my feet because of the way that she deliberated the encouraging words, you know, but also there were times when things got rough and when things got rough, you know, the encouragement weren't, wasn't like it was. And it really had the ability to tear me down. And when those, you know, when she came to me out of the negative aspects of how she felt, then it caused me to see myself from a negative aspect. Because one thing that you can trust about a man, whether he deliberates it to you or not, he's already beating himself up from where he feels like he should be, but he's not, or should be providing and he's not, or being more for the kids and he's not. One thing about us as men is that is something that is in us, whether we deliberate it or not. So to highlight what he already knows where he's missing the mark where he's not at it almost like kicking a dog while he's down you know and so um from that perspective i would say always encourage always encourage and 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 like how i said god did with me even as a son even though your husband may miss the mark you let him know like babe i seen you did that so let's do something different but make sure you bring that affirmation and who he is and why you got with him in the first place and the in the first place and the values that you see in him um as your husband your boyfriend your fiance or whatever it is that you guys plan on being together and then the second remember that your words can build or your words can tear down so what would you do with your words that is awesome mama i hope you are taking notes i know i am over here okay some highlights y'all take it to god be the wise woman that builds your house and speak life and encouragement because that'll make your man feel like he gonna fly you can just go ahead and rewind and re-listen to that right there that he just said is <laughs> gold. <laughs> but, you know, talking about that, speaking life, speaking encouragement, this is what, you know, what this podcast really is all about, speaking life into our children and encouraging with the Bible. So tell me a little bit about that. Like, have you had moments where the Holy Spirit, you know, in a sense, took you, redirected your words, maybe a phrase or um, a thought you were having towards your children, and then gave you something different, something, of course, from his word, because anytime he speaks, you know, it usually, it, it always connects with his word. So do you have a moment like that that you could share? Yes, I'll say two things. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example and then and then I'll 
you know, share the other comment. The first example is, well, I'll, I'll share the comment first. Well, first, I was learning how to be a father on the job. And so learning how to be a father on the job, one thing you can trust is, is if you became a father, if you were already a father, then you came into God and now you're learning um, his way and his will and how he fathers you, then you're going to see where you haven't been as effective. And so realizing where I haven't been as effective and beginning to change in the process, like I said, it was new for my kids too. And so I remember when my older boys were younger and they were still in the house with me having to sit them down and sitting them down. And I said, listen, one thing that I did with my older boys was I took their voice away. And what I mean by that is oftentimes, you know, as because we hold the title as mom or hold the title as dad, it's what we say go you listen to me or do what I say and not what I do or whatever it is. We, it's easy to override their feelings, their perspective, their emotions, or um, however they feel. It's easy to override that because we're the parent and we've already walked so many miles through life past them. And we're, we want, we want the best for them and we're showing them the way. And that's absolutely a awesome and amazing thing. But in the process, you cannot take their voice away and you take your kid's voice away by overriding them and your kids will grow older and they'll go into business meetings or into relationships and they'll never know how to speak up, um, to say how they feel or to, um, give a good idea because you took their voice away, um, while they were younger and then they never learned how to speak up even when they're frustrated or whatever the situation is. So that's a mistake that I made with my older boys. And, um, as I began to learn how to be uh, a better, more effective father, I had to sit my older boys down and I said, hey, I want you, I want y'all to tell me exactly how y'all feel about me. And if there's any way that I've affected y'all in a negative way, I want y'all to know this is a safe haven place that I'm not going to get upset, um, that I'm not going to get mad. Like, I really want to know how you feel, because that's the only way that I can do something different, fix it. Or not only that, if you don't speak for yourself, then you allow the opportunity for the enemy to speak for you. And so because of how I was handling things and taking their voice away and not listening to their perspective, then the, the whole time there were years that went past where the enemy spoke for me. And so I remember sitting them down and telling them it's safe and they can talk to me. And one of the things that they agreed on, my older two older boys said, they said, dad, um, we feel like you're a hypocrite. And, you know, as a dad, my first response want to be, well, I'll bust you upside your head. What you mean that, you know, but at the end of the day, <laughs> I have to, because <laughs> that's the daddy in me. And that's how I was raised. A certain stuff you don't say to your parent, you know? So my, my flesh wanted to respond like that. But the spirit of the Lord said, listen, why do they feel this way? So I asked them, why do you feel this way? And they said, well, it's certain things that you don't want us to do that you do. And I had to think, and they were absolutely right. So at that point in time, either I can go on my my ego trip and say, well, I'm the parent. And so I'm able to do this or I'm allowed to do this, or I can apologize and be a better example. And so what I did, I chose to apologize. And I said, forgive me. Um, I never meant it in this way. And I apologize that you received it this way. That was never my intention. And I have been a hypocrite and I'm going to make better decisions and do better. That way you don't see me that way, you know? And, and from that point in time, I began to allow them to have a voice, to talk to them more, to gain a deeper perspective of how they feel and where they're at. But, you know, by the time that they reach 16, 17, 18, they're already kind of forming their opinions and their perspectives. And so more than I can say anything, then I have to produce the right fruit now from the conversations that I already had. And then it's the, the, the difference in, in learning from my older boys is with, with my younger boys, they're 12 and 14. And they stay with me right now. And sometimes, and, and I answer all of the questions that they have when I discipline them, you know, I discipline them. And if I highlight something that they did wrong, but when they get good grades or they do what they're supposed to do, um, then I, um, I keep that same energy. I may give them a couple of dollars, go buy them some shoes, buy them some outfits. I may go, I'm going to reward them and keep that same energy the way that I magnified the bad thing that they did. I'm going to magnify the good thing. And I also allowed them the opportunity, as long as they're mannerable and respectful, tell me how you feel. I will never take your voice away because who am I to take away something that God gave you? Now I'm playing God and I'm telling you that what you have, and if I'm not directly telling you that I'm exerting myself or giving off the energy that what you have isn't as valuable, but if any, everything that God gave you is valuable. And so being that way, you know, with my younger boys, it really um, allowed our relationship to be closer. And 
I remember even just like a week and a half ago, I was just uh, out of town and one of my younger boys called me every single day. And I'm like, what's up? He's like, I just miss you, dad. I miss you, dad, dad, dad. What you doing, dad? What you doing? Like he just wanted to <laughs> know what his dad was doing. And uh, there sometimes they come to me with, you know, these different videos and stuff like that. And I'd be thinking like, what in the world do these boys have me watching? But it's what is valuable to them. It's what they're thinking about. It's their perspective. So I get into it. I engage with them and I let them know how they feel, what they think matters you know what i'm saying and then and the good thing about it is i don't have to make the mistakes that i made with my older boys and that, that with my younger boys and so my older boys come over now and they're like y'all got y'all spoiled by dad dad spoils y'all and i tell them like it's not that they're spoiled they just have a different dad than you guys had and so uh if i could summarize what I just said is when you discipline them, make sure you bring affirmation, always bring affirmation, always leave on a good note. No one wants to leave on a bad note. You leave on a bad note and you just corrected them. Then now they got thoughts in their head. If I don't ever do nothing right, or um, mom don't like me or dad's mad at me, or you know what I'm saying? So speak for yourself and make sure you bring that affirmation with that. And lastly, as long as they're respectful and mannerable, allow your kids to have a voice, allow them to, to like teach them to, to speak up and to look people in the eye and to shake hands firmly and to be direct, bold, and assertive without being disrespectful. Because that's how God is. God is direct. He's bold. He's assertive. He says what he means. He means what he says. He doesn't waver. So why wouldn't, if, 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 if we're made in his image and his likeness, then that's the same thing that we should be. So why take that from my child just because I have the title as a parent? You know, and I, and just like when I, like I said, like a week and a half ago, I was um, out of town and I remember my my niece, she's 25 years old. I remember her telling my sister, my sister is 43. And she told my sister, she said, she said, mom, she says, I love you. And you don't never have to uh, apologize to me for anything, because at a certain time, you know, I got to an age where I got to make my own decisions. And I realized you weren't put here to be my mom. I just came along on your journey. And that stuck with me so like, like, like that was so powerful to me to hear this young 25 year old say that to her mom and not only bring her mom peace, just in case her mom had those thoughts or those doubts of where the enemy spoke to her about where she may have missed the mark. But then just just the the, the wisdom that the, my niece had and to be able to release her mom, you know, that just blessed me so much. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. I want to be respectful of your time, but I have one last pressing question. And that is talk about how you've seen that you are a better parent when you lean on the Holy Spirit, like really talk about how you lean in the Holy Spirit, because I heard you say, you know, basically all of that, how you're a better parent. But how do you lean into the Holy Spirit as you're parenting your boys? Well, I realized that in the heat of the moment, if you didn't think about it, then you're just reacting and you can't just react to a situation. And one thing that I realized in years and years of just reacting and responding was when you feel some type of way, however you feel, that's how you're going to give it. So if me and you had a disagreement and it upset me and it made me feel some type of way, well, when I allow you to understand how you made me feel, it's going to come from a place from how I feel. And if, that, if, 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 if it's hot, then I'm going to hand you something hot. And if I hand you something hot, what's going to happen? You're going to get burned. So leaning on the Holy Spirit, one thing that the Holy Spirit always does is the Holy Spirit always makes you look at you. Why do you feel the way that you do? Why do you want to respond the way that you respond? Do you think it'd be more effective if you say this? Or do you need to wait? Or do you need to not say anything at all? So leaning on the Holy Spirit, it really allows you to pick your battles, but also to bring your deliberation in love because God is love. And because we come from love and we was made from love, then we all desire to be loved. And one way that God deals with us is with love. And so um, if we lean on him or we acknowledge him in all our ways and allow him to direct our paths, that he will always, even in our directness and boldness and being assertive, if the posture of our heart is a posture of love, then it's, you don't have to fix up your words and you don't have to sugarcoat anything. It's going to come from a heart of love. So that's how it's going to be received. That is so amazing. That is so true. I can say that is true, even for me with my one-year-old, where the Holy Spirit has been like, wait, don't just snap at her with 
because she just <laughs> spilled water all over the place. Like she, what is she wanting to do? And why are you getting upset? Pick your bottles. Like it's just water, right? Nothing broke. Right. Okay. <laughs> So I totally understand that as so, so huge. And it's beautiful to hear that it'll be um, cultivated for later years. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you recently launched a God sized dream, something that was born out of the father's heart and is called the Malachite movement. Tell us what it is about and, you know, just share. Well, the Malachi movement, it is about uh, rehabilitating fathers. Um, Malachi 4 and 6 says, uh, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. And this is Malachi 4 and 6. This is the last thing that God said before a 400 year silence of where um, before Yeshua came on the scene. And so I believe that like God showed me that with all of the deaths going on in the world right now, and you know, you got kids dying at, at young ages and kids also killing kids at, at young ages. One of my favorite shows to watch is first 48 and it's a reality kind of a cop show that um, shows the first 48 minutes of after someone has been murdered. And one thing that stands out to me in this show and even in the city where I come from is a lot of times the ones dying and the ones that are doing the killing are between the ages of like 14 and 20, 21. And it's crazy. And what God showed me is that the curse is in effect because of the lack of fatherhood. And so, you know, God gave me Malachi movement. And so a Malachi movement, um, it is a Christ centered ministry dedicating, dedicated to igniting men to become active fathers, whether men have children or not, um, they can still become great influencers across the world and change generations. You don't have to be a father in order to be a a, an example of a father. I mean, reason why I say that, because I know women, my pastor's wife, she has the spirit of fatherhood, you know? And so one thing that I realize is whether you got kids or not, whether you're a man or woman or not, God will use whosoever he will to get his will done, you know? And so God just showed me the need for fathers and with the revelation, wisdom, knowledge, the transformation that has took place and just the openness to allow him to impart into me the fatherhood that he gives me. Um, it gave me a heart for the fathers and to rehabilitate the dads. And so one thing that I can say that as the word says, it was freely given. It was, I freely received it. So I have to freely give it. I know he didn't just give it to me just for uh, my own selfish needs, but everything that God gives you, he gives it to you um, with the purpose. And so it just gave me a deep desire and a passion just to see fathers in place that we can raise uh, effective, efficient and um, good men instead of having to heal adults. Wow, that is such a beautiful dream. And I know that it's going to come into effect and it's going to take by force. It's going to transform men's hearts back to the father and then back to their sons. It's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And y'all stay tuned for the prayer on Friday because Minister B can pray. He can bring heaven down. Y'all going to see. So get excited. Come back and hear what he's got to say, how he prays for his sons, how he decrees and declare the word. Okay, Mr. V, where can fathers find you? Where can we get some more? Where can we see you in action? What the Malachi movement, where can we follow you? You can follow Malachi movement on Facebook at Malachi Movement, uh, M-A-L-A-C-H-I Movement, or you can go to Instagram and follow me at Malachi Movement on Instagram. And uh, also be on the lookout for Malachi Movement YouTube, and my sons will be launching Malachi Movement on TikTok. And so uh, we got a lot going on and a lot coming, so stay tuned. All right, that is so awesome. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. Thank you again, Minister V. Uh, so appreciate your time here. Absolutely. All right. Hola, mamá. 
Antes de que te vayas, déjame preguntarte. Did you benefit from today's episode y aprendiste algo nuevo? Leave a review in iTunes, The Spanglish Mama, a Juby Joy Podcast. Y suscríbete. Me encantaría conectarme contigo en social media. Búscame con el nombre The Spanglish Mama Podcast. Allí te espero. Thank you.